Hey, hey, what's going on? It is Tuesday night. I am Melanie Browning with Spotlight. And tonight I'm bringing to you rock musician Greg Tryon. So he'll be jumping on here shortly, hopefully, and we'll get going. So, hey, Mike, how you doing tonight? Thanks for joining. Really good to see you. Let's see. Oh, and Greg is here. Awesome. How's it going, man? Uh, going all right. I don't know uh, what the format is or what we're talking about, so I'm just trusting you to tell me what to do. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you some questions. You answer the ones that you want, how you want it, like you do best. You're pretty awesome I answer about more that. questions. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Yo. You ask them very well, though. So, oh, thank yes, you. yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, so, jumping right in, can you give us a background on... Um, music where you found it I, I discovered some really cool things about you looking through all of the wonderful m material that you have on your YouTube channel um, but can you share with us your insights of what really led you to um, discovering music um, and your joy for it well I mean I uh, I wasn't really a music fan until I saw Kiss live when I was a teenager somehow I ended up at a Kiss concert and, um, like, I didn't ask to go, but, like, I just ended up there. And it, um, it you know, it just, it was, a, it was a big difference for me. Before that, I didn't really understand why people liked music. And then I think, um, you know, seeing the, the big show and actually, I think it was because when you're a kid, like, the, the people on television almost don't seem real to you. And so mm -hmm. when you see someone who you see on TV and you see them live in the flesh, it kind of blows your mind in a way. And so I think that experience and the fact that like in between songs, uh, Paul Stanley was talking about like, believe in yourself, follow your dreams, work hard, you can do it, friendship. I'm like, oh man, I like all these things. And um, you know, the songs were catchy. And so that made me uh, a Kiss fan. And then I decided to like, you know, learn their history and then I realized that, like, all my friends were into bands, and I knew nothing about music. So I'm like, I need to catch up. And so I, like, dove headfirst into researching music. And in researching music, I discovered, like, the history of music and discovered, like, where splits were and how the culture had changed and how it, in my opinion, had changed for the worse. And so I started doing music because I wanted to adjust the music. And, um, that shift kind of ended up happening uh, without me needing to be successful. So that makes uh, the desire to retire much easier because I'm like, oh, sweet. You guys did this anyway. I don't have to worry about it. That's cool. My job is done. So I lost you. I lost you a little bit on there. What, at what point did you, um, you, you said about the, the music going in different ways and um, what, so what was that, that you, the road that you wanted to take it down? or that you felt uh, it, it needed to, the path it needed to go down? So it was uh, in the early 90s, there became this desire for like authenticity at all costs. And also like everything had to be like really deep and uh, poetic and dark. And you couldn't necessarily be happy or optimistic. And uh, I feel like there's this idea that if something is dark and edgy, uh, that automatically means good in some people's minds. Like, so, you know, the way that some people would say, like, I won't watch Disney movies because they're for kids. I only watch things for adults. The trick is some of those adult films are of lower quality than some Disney films. That's not to say that every Disney film is great and every uh, dark adult film is terrible. But there's an idea that just because something fits a certain mold, it's automatically better and a more legitimate form of art. And I found that a lot of the stuff that was coming out was just pretentious, trying really hard to say something, but was ultimately saying nothing. And so that is, I think I lost you there for a second, but I paused yeah. when I saw it. it stopped. I was saying that is generally unappealing to me when you're trying to, like, you're trying to be like, aren't we deep, bro, but you're not saying anything. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. but you can be deep, but like, don't waste my time, like, acting like you're deep when you're not and well, and know, so yeah that that's so i was going against that and just like let's just do something happy and fun um and there'll be layers beneath it uh but that, that 
So I lost you again, if you can hear me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, first time doing the Instagram live. But what I was saying is that uh, the um, I was trying to go for something that was more optimistic uh, and fun, but still with the layers of depth underneath. Just because you're optimistic and fun doesn't mean you can't have depth. And that's that's what's so neat about I, I I've been following you and I've I've watched a lot of your vi videos. I don't understand and I haven't done the deep dive on the music um, like you do. And I'm absolutely fascinated with how like deep you go with your videos and and the following that you have and how everyone really goes into the deep dive. But also like with you, like I'll I'll admit when I first saw you and I first saw you know your cover picture, I'm like awesome, you know rock star right there. Um, but it, it, you're not about just, you know, like, like you're saying, like, um, you're about bringing the authenticity and who you really are to it. And like how Kiss spoke to you in, in one of your videos, you go really deep on how, you know, they really motivated you to really be authentically who you are. And that's what's so cool. Like you have no problem talking about Frozen and that you're a Frozen fan and you can go in any direction. And it really is you're so authentic about what it is you like and what you enjoy. And I think that's what really, really just draws me to your work and to watch your interviews. And um, so I, I, I love that. It's so beautiful to see and I get it. And I think that's why um, you had me on your show um, that your podcast that's coming out dealing with um, that goes over meatloaf fat out of hell. And I'm a big fan there. So what, what, I love about that and what what you just said reminded me because in the 90s is when I discovered it and I was big into grunge yet at the same time I was exposed to meatloaf and I didn't really understand it but being that big performance um, type of an album and um, and then seeing all the different type of bands that you like is that something that just really attracts you is that what is it about like the different type of bands that you enjoy that really pull you in um, because a lot of the things you do seem, seem different than the normal, I guess, American type rock star fans. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the trick is you mentioned that the, you thought the frozen thing was cool. Also, hi, Christine, I see you. Um, the, the trick is some of my eccentricities, especially with the second album, turned off a lot of fans. The album sales went downhill very much after the first album. And so I, one of the things I realized is that I have a wider palette than maybe my audience does. And that is something that you have to be aware of as an artist is that, you know, I know thousands of albums of, you know, different genres and different styles of music, but the average consumer might not be coming at it with that breadth of knowledge and so something that is a clever reference to me might just go over the head of the listener and so as an artist you need to know like when to pull it back and consider what the audience uh, perception of your work will be so uh, that is something I wanted to say first but as far as the kind of music I like it really it honestly it really varies uh, you know typically I would say the most important thing for me in music is um, melody and pop craft is usually what is the most important to me. So is it uh, melodically pleasing? And is your song structured in such a way where like, is it catchy? Can you sing along to it? And so uh, in general, like when I'm comparing it to uh, like, let's say a grunge act, uh, which I'm not as much of a fan of the like very like low pitched melodies that kind of meander around the same chords over and over again. So you got muddy guitars, muddy melodies that's not appealing to me versus you've got like the Beatles and uh, Meatloaf with like the layers of the vocal harmonies uh, frozen with some of the best singers ever in Broadway on that soundtrack. Um, and so it's not just technical skill. It's about, uh, I guess, craft of the piece. Say that a lot of people don't know how to write songs is sort of my issue. They know how to play their instruments, but they, get too self-indulgent with just like, look how good I am at playing my guitar rather than is my guitar playing something that you want to listen to. And so like, you know, my taste varies so much that it's hard to like have a, a catch all for all of them because, you know, I listen to, to Rush. I listen to jazz. I listen to Jim Steinman. I listen to soundtracks from video games and movies I haven't seen or played just because I think the musical quality is so strong. 
And, like, I know I'm not going to play them because I'm, like, too damn busy. But I'm like, this is a great soundtrack for a video game I'll probably never play in my life. So it's more just I'm attracted to quality. And, you know, there are, it's easier to pinpoint things I don't like. So, like, I'm listening to uh, an ambient, uh, like, rock album where the lyrics are vague. They don't mean anything. The songs are all really long and repetitive. And the vocals are mixed so low you can barely hear them. And so, like, I guess music that is maybe more background, I'm not as into. I like music to grab your attention. And so if it's just, like, you know, there's a, there's a time and place for ambient music, and there's some of it I really like. But in general, you know, I'm attracted to quality. That makes sense. And Christine's saying that you have a great respect for great lyrics and storytelling. Yeah, I think I, ha I I care about lyrics more than a lot of musicians, especially in my genre. Because, like, hair metal, the genre I'm best known for, the lyrics are mostly trash. Like, they're mostly terrible, and I fully acknowledge that. And it's just, for me, I always thought hair metal would be the best genre of music if the lyrics were better. It's just the lyrics weren't better for the most part. Uh, but, like, you know, that genre has, you know, guys, really good singers, really, like, everyone in hair metal, you have to be a really good musician to play it. It's hard to play. And then all the songs are just about partying and getting late. And I just, I wish there was more depth to it because like on a technical level, they're some of the best bands out there. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Um, and I, I do definitely enjoy the storytelling as well. I think that's what um, connected on that, the Bad Out of Hell album as well. Um, now, I did have a question when you referenced before about, um, pre seeing kiss you didn't have you were probably a little bit more on the more i don't know would you would you classify as like a depressed side growing up or just that kiss just kind of open your eyes to something else uh i was depressed growing up because i grew up in like an abusive household um and so that was more the depression i didn't really have like meaning in life necessarily and so, but by the time I saw Kiss, I had moved out of that household and I was like generally happy-go-lucky and optimistic. And so I didn't necessarily have a direction in life, but I was like happy and just enjoying freedom and safety. And um, so I became, I'm, I tr I'm generally attracted to optimistic works, to things that are about the triumph of the human spirit. So like, you know, the Rocky movies or or Naruto, like... That kind of stuff, which, by the way, I will um, say this for the, for the listeners at home. Uh, Naruto is, um, has some of the worst fans out there who don't realize how good it is, but like, the quality of that show is much better than its fan base. So if you're like, oh, man, he's a Naruto guy, like, yes, I know, the fans are trash, but it's probably the greatest story ever told by humans. Um, but I, I tend to like that really you know, optimistic, believe in yourself, coming out of adversity stuff. And, you know, maybe it's because I grew up in the 90s where there was so much angst. And a lot of my uh, friends, when, you know, when we were in high school, they'd all complain about, like, the pettiest stuff. And I just wouldn't care. And it's just, like, you don't actually have problems. Your problems are, like, oh, no, my mom is being passive-aggressive. And, I'm like, I got beat up and raped as a kid and stabbed in a mental asylum. I'm sorry your mom is being a little bit bitchy when she has too much wine, you know. And so... I would, you know, tell a lot of my friends, like, you know, you don't really. And they were listening to all this, like, depressing music, watching all these depressing movies. And that was, like, really the culture. You know, it was 90s, you know, grunge was what they were fed as kids. And then, you know, moving into, like, emo and cutting. And I'm just like, this is just not a healthy culture. And so that was why I decided I wanted to change that. Awesome. So you did a, um, are you the one that formed Lipstick Generation or how did that evolve? Yeah, that was uh, basically the, what happened with that was it started off where I, I had the idea for the band and I knew I would want, uh, I'm trying to think of how, how to describe the story. So I had um, a bunch of songs sitting around that I wanted to record and I hired an entire like band and a producer and then they all sucked, and I fired them. They didn't understand what I was doing musically because, like, they were trying to play them, like, ska songs. And just, like, they didn't have the musical background for it. So I ended up uh, hiring a guy named Billy Morris who was a friend of mine who used to play in Warrant and Quiet Riot. I called him up, and I said, hey, do you want to, you know, play guitar 
on my songs. And he said, not only will I play guitar, but I'll produce them. We'll record them at my studio. I'll help you do the entire project. I'll find you musicians if you need help. And so it was, it started off as a studio project with the idea that I would take the demo to Nashville and then find musicians to play it live. And if I had like all the songs done, there'd be no confusion about direction. Like this is what it sounds like. This is what we're going for. Because when you're just one guy with a guitar and a piano, it's hard to describe what you want musically, especially if like you don't have like a reference point. So having that album really helped explain to people like, hey, this is what it sounds like. Play it like this. And that template really helped me going forward. Because like any time, you know, there'd be ever like confusion about what we were supposed to do. Like I was always the, I was the, I'm the Jim Steinman of the band, essentially. I'm the guy who writes the songs, uh, the guy who's also not very good at singing. And I am the Jim Steinman of the band. And um, that's actually something that uh, Billy Morris told me when we were working on the first album, is that I, um, out of all the musicians in the world, he said I was closest to Jim Steinman. Like that, he rem I reminded me him of uh, Jim quite a bit, and he said that was probably the closest one for one parallel that he saw. That's awesome. That's a that's a beautiful compliment, <laughs> and I know you yeah. said that many times. So, um, uh, speaking of that, who do you think um, with Kiss, kind of opening your eyes to that and becoming a fan there? Who do you think is your biggest influence or your number one? And I know you said it changes, but what is your number one? Um, musical influence in your in your. I, I lost you there. Uh, could you just repeat that? I'm sorry. Who is your number one musical um, um, influence in your career? Um, I guess in terms of like career, if I'm looking at it like what I'm known for, I think that it's. Um, it would probably have to be Kiss because that's probably the band we're most similar to. Uh, you know, the whole superhero shtick, the the flamboyant costumes. But I mean, really, like you, I, I, what I tried to do is I view, you know, music and art as like, um, you, you learn from the masters, you study the masters, you understand how they did things, why you analyze it, and then you make it your own. You combine different things and try to establish your own identity. So, I mean, Kiss is probably the band we're most similar to, but I mean, you know, there's elements of Jim Steinman in the writing, there's elements of Van Halen in the writing, there's elements of the Beatles in the writing, it's, there's elements of Billy Squire in the writing. So there's all these different lessons you learn from different musicians, and you put them in your toolkit, and then it's a matter of deciding what is the appropriate tool for this situation. And so you understand, oh, something like the raspberries might be good here. And you just, you understand techniques you add them to your repertoire you try to develop your own unique style but then you remember like you know what would be a good thing to put in this song oh you know a dream theater-esque drum fill would go good here it's just you just you you learn these different things and you just try to make your own thing but you know uh, in terms of songwriting um you know i've written so many different you know kinds of songs but kiss for the for the stuff i'm famous for it'd be kiss um, for the 13th C Cross soundtrack, um, I would say that was, um, there was definitely a lot of Jim Steinman influence in the main theme. That was because I, from techniques I learned from playing Jim Steinman songs, I was able to write the main theme. And then for the rest of it, um, it was honestly a matter of, because that was, um, you know, Joe gave me specific direction of what he wanted. It was listening to film scores that he liked, not stuff that I was necessarily a fan of but saying, hey, listen to this. I'm looking for something like this. Learning, understanding what they did. Learning, understanding what they did, waiting for the pause to, for the thing to stop freezing. But, you know, learning what they did and then composing based upon that. So, you know, it's, um, I think musical analysis is, you know, probably my strongest suit. And, um, you know, I got that from listening to a lot of different stuff. Does that give you the most, like, for you personally, what's most satisfying to you? Is it, is it the writing? Is it um, figuring all of that out? Is it performing on stage? Is there one thing that, that trumps the other for you? So I think the thing that I like the most is finishing the task and getting it out there. 
So I would say, like, I like writing the song, but I like even more that, like, I've done all the steps to get the song out there. So, like, written it, recorded it, you know, produced it, engineered it, promoted it. Well, actually, I hate the promoting part. That part sucks. Um, really, the thing that I really hate is having good ideas and sitting on them. I absolutely hate that. Like, I'm all about progress. I'm all about moving forward. I'm all about not standing still. So I, it, the thing that frustrates me the most is that when I have all these great ideas and I have to sit on them, and it's always due to time and money. It's always due to those two things every single time. And it's um, like we have a, a, maybe like, you know, 40 great songs. We were going to do a double album as our, as our next album. Um, but then our, our drummer fell through that we were going to play, have play on the album. And then we didn't have the budget to pay someone like for that many songs. And so like, we have these great songs that are just sitting there in demo form um, that just like probably won't get heard for a very long time. You know, if we record them, they might just get released as demos. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the band largely stopped is that it was costing too much money to make versus what was being brought in. And so it's like, I can spend all this money recording this song and it's still satisfying, but like if I need money for rent and groceries, I can't pay the studio drummer. And um, unfortunately, we set such a bar of quality where like we can't step down uh, and like hire people who are like you know going to half ass it. So like if I have to pay someone, it has to be someone good. And if it's someone good, it's going to cost me. And so you know we hit this impasse where like it, we weren't bringing enough money in to cover the expenses. Like there was a point where we were. There was a point where we were killing it with merch sales, killing it with CD sales. Like we were doing really well playing big shows. And, you know, then you, you hit a wall and it's, it is really, really tough. And the thing is, like I was listening to one of these demos the other day and it's like such a great song. Like I'm not saying this is like with an ego thing, but like I want the fully produced song to exist so I can listen to it. Because I'm like, this is a killer song. I, I write stuff that I'm a fan of. Um, I'm probably in the future, I'm going to hire different singers. I'm going to retire as a singer. I'm done singing my songs. I'm like, this is a really great song. I want this song to exist. And it's a bummer that it doesn't. So that's one reason why I've uh, moved into writing because my, my greater passion has always been writing. So, you know, knocked out a screenplay last year, working on another screenplay right now, working on a extended, um, uh, I would say audio drama series, but it might just be a serialized novel that I'm working on with a co-writer that's really awesome. And, you know, that stuff with, with the budget's much lower, you can just get it out yourself and there's no one stopping you but yourself. You know, that's what I'm all about. I'm all about no excuses. So like, if everything in the world is stopping me from making music, then whatever, I'll make something else. But I'm not going to let it be for any lack of effort on my part. So I'm all about putting in 100% doing what you got to do, just like not giving up. And it, it really does show in all of the things that you do. Like uh, you continually do it on, on, you know, the posts that you make. It's, 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 and it's not in a way that you're bragging at all. It's like, Hey, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. You, you let people know about setbacks that you have too, and that you push through. And I, I find you to be extremely motivating. There are oftentimes like, it's, it's amazing how this universe works where I'm just having one of those days where it's like, well, I don't really need to do that. And then bam, there'll be, one of your posts with, you know, that dumbbell and that pen representing yeah, the working exercise out and the me. writing. Yeah, try, I try to exercise my mind every day with writing and try to exercise my body every day with, you know, working out. That's not to say I succeed every day. Um, like, you know, I try my best and some days you just can't where you're just like, oh, shoot, I have five hours worth of chores after work. And just it just happens and you can't do it. But you just, you know, you, you, you try your best each day. You know, I some days you do better than others, but you just, you know, keep trying, you know, I wake up at five in the morning every day to try to get everything done. Some days I do, some days I don't, but I still get up at five every day to try. That's awesome. What do you do um, in when there's something like you said, you know, you have all these songs that are over there and they're still there. Do you remain focused on it to, to, to find a solution to get those out? Or is it, do you have to put it on a different burner? Is there, some way you're able to compartmentalize or how do you process that? Um, well, with those songs in particular, it was just a matter of me saying like, I don't have the money for this. 
I can't make it happen right now. And so I'm just focusing on like what I can do. I try to focus on like what is the most efficient, effective use of my time? What's going to yield the best results? Um, so right now I'm working on a screenplay because this is what I feel is the best option for potentially making money. Like of all the projects I have, what is the most commercial? What would I have the best chance of selling with my connections in the industry? Like what is my best bet? It's this. And it's not necessarily the passion project. But after I finish that, I am going to uh, go into writing novels and, and step back to the screenplay simply because I don't like it as much. Um, the amount of cutting you have to do in a film is like, I, it's really hard to tell a good story in film. And I think it is not a good medium in general. I think most movies are bad. It's just, you know, there are some good ones. But in general, I prefer the medium of books. I think there's more time to tell a story. I think there's more freedom for the author. You're not constrained by budget. Um, so I'm, I'm writing screenplays right now. And I'm enjoying it. But, you know, the, it's, it's sort of like, you know, figuring out your priorities. It's scheduling. Like, you look at how many hours you have in a day. I'm like, okay. I've got to work eight hours. I've got maybe two hours worth of chores each day. Uh, and, you know, what is my timetable? I try to set like an end date for your project. Try to figure out how much progress you're going to be making. Try to figure out when the Instagram live freezes on you. You know, all those things. <laughs> but I, it's, you know, just like it's looking at your big list of projects and saying, what can I make the most progress on? What is going to be the best? And you know, do I always succeed with what is the best choice of action? Obviously, if I did, then I'd be, you know, with, you know, swimming in boatloads of cash right now. So you just try to make the best judgment call for each decision. You know, the first album, I seemed to have picked the right songs. You know, the, the labels were interested, the, the fans were interested, the sales were good. You know, you, you just, you try to make the best choice based upon your artistic material you have at the time and hope it works out. Well, it's a great reference point. So that's, that's super good that you have that, you know, and, and you learn, you know, very well, you're very in tune with things and you, you know, you've studied so much and you've dug into um, the greats. So I, you know, it's just a matter of working it out. So it's, it's great to, to watch you do those things. And I, 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 I want to say thank you so much for opening my eyes as far as, um, you know, I consider myself a music fan, but I really realized that I just, I just listen to listen to what feels good and what is there. I really have such a lack of knowledge of the music industry and um, the greats that are out there. And just, I mean, I love artists, but to really, I haven't done a deep dive. So I'm so grateful that you have so much information with the artists that you enjoy um, available and you share it and you get differing opinions. And um, one of the things that really stood out to me in listening to your videos was um, when you cover some of the bands that have like a really long lasting career and how they change throughout that and how a lot of times fans might react negatively because they're expecting kind of what they had before. And, you know, as a band grew, they changed a little bit and they dared to do something different, something that was more mm -hmm. in tune with that. And you show a lot of respect for that, even with the ones that maybe didn't take the direction that you wanted. And um, I just, I really appreciated that honesty and that view and that just open-mindedness. And um, I think a lot of fans can learn from that if they're open to listening to that, to really give artists that space to be able to, to grow and show more of themselves. So we're not trying to fit in, you know, a certain box just because that's what the fans expect. So, um, well, thank you. I, I appreciate and, uh, that greatly from, from you. Well, you know, uh, unfortunately, I am very much the minority on that. A lot of people get really upset when artists change. And, you know, it's, uh, it's the nature of the beast. And I think one of the things that I think is very important um, for aspiring artists to consider, you, you should consider audience reaction. You should consider, like, what your average audience member is and what they will think of this. You shouldn't let it cripple you. And you shouldn't let it uh, go against the muse. Like if you and your heart really feel it needs to be a certain way and you think that there might be negative feedback, you know, you have to weigh that out. But I think it is important to consider like what is the average person 
who is likely to consume this art going to think. So if I am, let's say, writing a uh, Disney script, I have to think, what is the average consumer going to think, re you know, watching this movie? Uh, if I'm basing off a fairy tale, they probably haven't read the book. So how can I make the story good for someone coming in fresh with no knowledge? You know, how do I grab that person's attention? And uh, same with the band. How can I make it where, you know, you just hear the song and you just get it right away? And the thing is, I made a lot of stuff that was really weird and eccentric that people did not get right away. And I thought people would be clever enough to get the joke. <laughs> Oftentimes, that's not the case. And so you have to consider, like, what is someone who has never heard this going to, you know, feel the very first time? So um, I think that's a very important thing to, to think about is audience consideration, like really thinking about, like, how would an audience react? But in general, like, yeah, I like when artists, like, get weird with it and do something different and do just, like, what they're feeling. Um, especially artists who I know are really skilled at the craft. So if it's someone who I know is like, you're just a killer songwriter, you know how to write a good song, you're just writing something different because you think it would be cool, I'm down with that. What they're doing, trying a bunch of different things, and they all sort of failing. So it's like when you have that track record of like, I know you know what you're doing, and you thought this would be cool, and then a bunch of people didn't get it, though that tends to work with me. Gotcha. That's super cool. So what is it? How can um, viewers get to know more about all of the wonderful knowledge that you have? Where is the best place for them to go and um, hear your opinions on music and see what you have going on? Uh, I mean, honestly, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a transitional phase right now where the YouTube channel is, you know, largely just me doing Thin Lizzy Thursdays because I committed to doing that. Um, but the thing is, I'm involved in so many things that... I don't have time to do as much like podcasting or, you know, spouting my music opinions or my opinions in general, just because I'm so busy. So the channel is still there. Uh, you know, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. Um, but, you know, probably the best thing to do is just um, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Watch out for my post because I've got some big stuff that's going to be coming out, you know, within the next year. Uh, specifically, the big thing that I'm working on that... I will want people to follow once it's out will be, we're going to be releasing a, a serialized story. So it'll be like new chapters every week, like a novel you can read online. And so that'll be announced. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And then when that's ready, that'll come out. I, you know, follow me on the YouTube channel. I'll make an announcement there as well. Uh, and for the screenplay I'm writing right now, you know, that's the annoying thing with being a writer versus being a musician, like a musician. It's like, I'm sending your attention all the time. Everyone look at me. Being a writer, you're alone, you're writing for like a year, and then no one sees it for like three years. So as I'm in this transition era, you know, as I'm phasing out one era of my life into another, um, like I don't have as much to promote because, you know, I'm doing something completely different. But I mean, I'm on all the streaming services as Lipstick Generation, so you can find it on Spotify, wherever you get. You know, check out the band, check out my YouTube channel. There's a bunch of my music on there. So, yeah, I'd say uh, the YouTube channel is pretty good. There's, there's playlists and stuff of my music, and then you can find it on all the streaming services. Awesome. Well, I'm very excited to see this new phase that you have coming out with. I'm a personal huge fan. I do love music, but I really, really love words <laughs> in general, so books are huge for me. So, And you I froze can't again, but I assume it was, it was nice things. <laughs> all good things so thank you so much thank you for being such a positive influence and um really motivating people to you know do what it is and i think be themselves is really kind of the big theme that i get from you to just be you know true to the feelings that you have so thank you for um putting that out there if that's what you're putting out as well as all of the other wonderful things that you do so Thank you so much. Is there anything else, any other bits of advice that you'd like to share while you're here? Um, I would say that um, authenticity is, I think, uh, very cool, but also so is putting on a show. Um, so, you know, don't go on stage in your street clothes. It's boring unless your street clothes are like leather jacket and leather, leather pants like me, in which case then you can be yourself. Um, but I guess I would say the... If I were to give advice to anyone, 
I would say like set goals and make sure you're consistently working towards them and don't make excuses. Just get it done, figure out a way to get it done and, and just like keep working at it. Like that's the only way you'll accomplish something is just like, you know, be it recording a song, getting an album out, say I need to get the drums done, then do this, then do this, then do this. Or even something is like, um, even when it comes to playing video games, it's like, all right, I want to beat this game. How do I do it? Okay, I need to do this task and this task and like get yourself on a schedule. Like whatever you need to do, just figure out a way to get it done. So no excuse. Sometimes things are out of your control and you need like $5,000 to record an album and you can't do it. But then if you can't do that, find something else. Just find a way, get it done. Awesome. Super great. Thank you so much for joining me here. And thank you, everyone. And I see Jimmy's here. Uh, Mr. Jimmy Smooth. Happy birthday, by the way. Shout out to him. Happy All birthday. Right. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, Greg. Bye.